Well, uh, thank you so much for having me. And this is my, my wife, Vicki, and she she uh, here to, to help and to listen. But um, she's... You don't need the mask. Yeah, you don't need oh, the mask. if I'm up here? Oh, that's great. Yeah. Okay, I can get away with it. Well, we can um, actually see your lips move and understand yeah. what you're saying. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to tell if someone's smiling at you or, or, or scowling at you. But uh, So we live in Mount Pleasant, uh, as Charlotte said. Uh, That's a long way from here. It's a, it's a ways from here, probably about 95 miles or something. But uh, And you came just for us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you're, not gonna go back. you're not going to go over 90 miles. Oh, yeah. Home. Yeah, we'll go home tonight. Yeah. it's uh, we're, We do this all the time. When people drive down there, they think it's like so far out in the country that they don't come visit us but we come up here all the time so this is yeah and we have two boys in Provo we'll go see them on the way home and have dinner with them and stuff like that so yeah we just make it a trip and we saw her sister on the way up and so but uh, as Charlotte said yeah I grew up in Denver born and raised in Denver Colorado uh, and Vicki grew up there uh, born in California but grew up there and we met one summer we were both BYU students and we met at a dance uh, on a summer break. So Over in Denver? In where? Denver, yeah. yeah. We were both home from BYU for a summer <laughs> summer break. And so where in Denver? I, grew, I was born in Denver, grew up in Lakewood. Do you know the area? Yes, I spent two years there with my husband went to a gunsmithing school there. Oh. In Clear, in Clear Creek area. In wh where? Clear Creek. Here? Bear? Yeah. Oh, Clear Creek. Where um, he is? Oh, yeah, where the Coors, Coors Brewery? Like Coors, yeah, it's in that area. Yeah, okay. Uh, my, my dad is buried right right next to the Coors Brewery. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it never, you know, just a coincidence. Vicki grew up in Arvada, so if you know the Denver area, we Arvada's. Arvada. We lived in Arvada for a few years. Oh, that's where she grew up. And Missed the tornado. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, we have four children. They're all pretty much out of the house. Our youngest is uh, at BYU and is engaged so uh, to be married. So um, we're, we're kind of empty nesters, but we they come back at periods of time for a few months or you know, in between their activities. So we, we love to have them, but um, they're spread out from Michigan to Kentucky to Utah. So you know how it is. You, I see some nods. Yes, your, your kids and your families are spread out. So. Uh, I went to BYU and got a master or a, B, a bachelor's and a master's in painting and drawing, uh, and uh, some time ago, I'm I'm not 70 whatever, yeah. But I don't know why that everyone tells me that the BYU website says I was born in 1941. I don't know where they came up with that. And I I should probably call them and correct that, but it's so just, it was about a decade later. That you were yeah, born? about a decade later. Yeah. More or less. <laughs> Yes, I tell my students at school. I teach part time at Snow College, and that's how I got associated with snow, the summer snow workshops. And uh, so I, I tell my students at Snow that I'm approaching 40 or something. I don't know, but that's a lie too. So this is my studio in Mount Pleasant. So Mount Pleasant is a small little town, 3,000 people, and uh, we were lucky to get one of the old historic. Of buildings on Main Street and uh, downstairs is an insurance company and upstairs you can kind of see on the window there with my, my name in the window but I, I my studio is upstairs and it's uh, I've been there 26 years and it's been just a great spot to be to have a studio it's uh, I'm spoiled oh here's a there's a shot from the inside oh, yeah. those old those big round uh, arched windows oh, that's which nice. Leak, leak. Uh, yeah, actually, there's not a lot in there at the time. Right now, it's it's kind of. That'd be on Main Street. Right? It's right on Main. Uh, right, exactly, yeah. right on Main Street. That's that's the only place in Mount Pleasant where those old buildings are, right on Main Street. So I'm on that first block from the traffic light. And uh, so you sell things as soon as you make them. No, no. Um, <laughs> there's a whole story behind that. Uh, in a way, that's that sounds great, but I but in a way that can be bad to sell everything you paint right right away. So I uh, 
right out of school at BYU, I started sending my, well, actually I was maybe still in school, and I started sending my paintings to a gallery on consignment. Mm -hmm. So if you're familiar with that, I'm sure, is, is you know you don't get paid until it gets sold, or when and if. So your paintings sometimes sit on the gallery walls for some time, and then, <clears throat> and then if it sells, they hopefully pay you uh, for that. Uh, <clears throat> it, yeah, so I, I send my work out to galleries, whether or not it sells right away, yeah, that's a whole other story. Sometimes they sit in the gallery for a while, you get them back, you rotate them to a different gallery. Sometimes they sit in a gallery for years and you think, well, oh well, that was a good try. You know, I'll, maybe I'll try that painting in another gallery. And then they call you up and say, remember that painting that's been here for five years, whatever, we just sold it. So sometimes it's good to just leave them there because you never know. It just the right person walks into the gallery at the right time and they fall in love with it and for five years no one else fell in love with it and it just takes the right person so the reason why I say sometimes it's not good <coughs> to uh, to sell everything you paint right away is because then you're tempted to paint what sold so you're kind of chasing the market instead of uh, just being, uh, just kind of painting the things you want to paint that are in your heart. If you say, wow, those, those one paintings sold really well, and you, then you just kind of, you're just chasing the market. And uh, I've seen that work in a negative way for some artists. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I, I joke that I've been uh, blessed that my paintings don't sell really fast. <laughs> of course, if you ask my wife and my kids, it would have been nice through some of those lean years to have sold some of the, <laughs> sold more of them. But uh, anyway, we, we've been we've been blessed. We've been lucky. Okay, so that's the inside of the studio, and just depending if I've sent paintings out to galleries, then the painting, then the gallery, uh, the uh, studio is kind of empty. Sometimes it's full. Sometimes it's you know got uh, all kinds of things. Right now it's kind of cluttered. <clears throat> There's just a shot of my uh, workstation. That's an old palette I had there, a glass palette. Maybe some of you like using a glass palette for oil paint. And uh, my easel with the painting in progress. So as Charlotte said, I do a lot of paintings of cloth. Things I can set up in the studio, drape a piece of cloth over uh, some kind of armature or a chair, something like that. And, and there are a few ones, a few in the background there. Hmm. I just realized. Oh, I. <clears throat> this is going back. This is not one of mine. I wish. I I thought I'd throw in a few slides of, of things that influenced me when I was younger. When I was really young in high school, I I'd never had any art history training, or I didn't know really hardly anything about art history. And I got to BYU and you take an art history class and the teacher showed this, you know, the old slide projectors. And this is a painting by Caspar David Friedrich, a German romanticist, painted in the, about eight, the early 1800s. And it, it just kind of struck me, you know, like fall out of your chair kind of reaction when I saw this and I just thought it was so beautiful and so profound and, and what I later maybe came up or, or looked up the word sublime in the in the dictionary and realized that this this was uh, something that really struck me and I love the sort of uh, like I said the sublime or the reverence in this piece and I that was sort of a model for me at that point was you know to try and achieve something like that uh, not not I didn't know if I was going to do landscape or something else, but to try and achieve that feeling, whatever it is you paint, whether you paint still life or, or florals or portraits or whatever it may be, or landscape, to try and capture the, the feeling that was in these. Uh, there's another one of Friedrich's. Am I blocking your view if I stand here? No, I, I, yeah, I, okay. I, I might, sure I might duck in. For some reason, it reminds me of Sierra Lewis of the I'm having trouble today. Yeah. yeah, almost like a dolly thing. 
in a way, but they're very accurate as far as, I mean, Dolly would change, right? He would distort. distort things, and these are quite accurate as far as uh, realism to, to the real landscape. So that place actually exists? Yeah, in Germany somewhere. Okay, he, he I'll lived stay in, away from that. I'll stay away from that. <laughs> Dres, Dresden, I think he lived in Dresden. I'm not sure uh, what part of Germany exactly. But they're haunting a little bit, aren't they? And that's, that's part of the sublime. If you if you study it on the, and I did a whole semester study on the whole idea of the sublime from literature and artists, and the sublime in nature is uh, can include not only things that are so awe-inspiring that we feel like we're so diminished, but uh, and, and so at the same time there's this feeling of, of reverence for the awesomeness of nature, but also this almost uh, uh, this attraction to something that could destroy us. I mean, there's there's some sort of a there's something that attracts us to uh, the unknown, even if it could be scary. All I know is that I would not have that in my house. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> if I had uh, say a hundred million dollars, which this painting would. Probably oh, sell for these days. I would live. Would with, I would live with that any day. Uh, I think this one, one of these. I think this one still exists. This one was destroyed in World War II. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. I believe if I have that right, one of them exists. One of them is gone. One, one of them is gone. gone. Uh, this is another painting that really influenced me, and uh, it's it's in the Prado Museum in Madrid, Spain. And when I, again, when I saw this in person, uh, it's just a very emotional, very uh, emotional experience. Uh, this is, uh, let me think if I can remember the right artist, Van der Weyden, Northern Renaissance, let's see. Uh, he, he would have been Flemish probably, which is now Belgium, if I have that right. Uh, called Descent from the Cross. And I just found it so beautiful that, uh, again, just uh, so beautiful it's almost haunting. I also, though, love Mark Rothko's works because I think it has some of those same qualities. They're a little haunting. I find them very beautiful, a, a lot of them, but there's something about them that are, uh, they're beautiful, but at the same time, Time they're a little dark or, or uh, yeah. that very faint image up there. Yeah. Yes, that's not a great slide. Has anyone been to the National Gallery in Washington D.C.? There's a room of these Rothkos, and that's this. They're as big as that screen, that whole screen. And you walk into a room of those, and there are these purples and blues and darks, and it's 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 a similar. Experience to me, as as the Friedrichs or the Van der Weyden is, is, you walk in there and there's this uh, almost overwhelming spiritual feeling that you get it, it, for me in the presence of those paintings. There's another Rothko. Yeah, I like it. I like. You it. like Roth You I like, like Rothko? Rothko? Yeah. <laughs> there's another one of my influences when I was in college. That's a book. That's a title of a book. Has anyone heard of that or read it? Yeah. Yeah, and I've read it, I think, at two times, maybe three, and I, and just the other day I thought, I should read that again because there's such, such great philosophical ideas in there about art. Well, not necessarily, I, to me it's about art. <coughs> he has this whole big philosophical discussion about quality, the idea of quality, and I just, for me that was like, okay, uh, I know, uh, in, the, in Zen Buddhism, you, if you start to describe it, then it's no longer what it is, but I want to try and reach that. It's sort of this trying to reach something that's unattainable. But, and, and then it, to me that related to the sublime. You're, you're reaching or you're going towards something that's actually seemingly unattainable. So to me, all those ideas related and kind of connected or somehow. Let's see, uh, well, those are what some things. Well, these are what a, a collector said of mine, which kind of fit into what 
I was striving for, he just said it better than I ever had. And so in years of doing talks like this, I, it was hard for me to describe what it was I was trying to attain with my paintings. And then this collector kind of described it better for me, uh, the presence of absence, exquisite longing for the unattainable. So uh, I was like, oh, thank you. Can I borrow your quote? <laughs> so I've been borrowing his quote ever since. And then the uh, a critic for the Arizona Republic newspaper, uh, powerful vacancy is both disturbing and serene. So that's, I think, what I was sort of getting out of some of those other paintings. And I didn't know it, but I think that's what subconsciously, maybe even I was trying to get in my paintings. But, so the, the terrible thing about that is now you get to judge whether I did it or not. <laughs> I set myself up for, anyway. You can be the judge. Uh, so that's one of mine. Now, I think the rest of them are mine instead of other artists. Uh, this is, um, well, I think everything I'm going to show is pretty much oil on canvas. And I usually like to work big. That's right about the life size right there. So it was something like four by six or somewhere in there, feet, 48 by 72, something like that, somewhere in there. And that is called Fall. Yeah. And I, I don't like to think up a whole bunch of different titles, so I start numbering them. So if I think, oh, Fall describes that painting, this one will be Fall number one, number two, number three. <laughs> I think this is Fall number nine. So. Are we meant to think of the season and the fall? It, yeah, and I like to give usually one word or a very short title and then you know it's really up to the viewer to say well to me that reminds me of the season or to me that could is that the fall of man is that the fall you know so so yes I so is it this or that or yes I mean to me it's kind of all the same but maybe maybe more the fall of man so I think do I have more of those yes so I've done a whole series of those I think, see, I, I've done so many of them, I'm not even sure which one is which anymore, but I think that's fall number 23, <laughs> and it, it's actually, the actual painting I, is bigger than that. It's five feet by eight feet, oh, and I did it for my parents' house. They have a big wall, and so I said. Is that upper seven on the right side, or is that an apple? It's an apple, they're both apples, both apples. yeah. kind of asked my parents, uh, I think it was their 40th or 50th, 50th anniversary coming up. And I, I said, you have that big wall in your house. I'd like to do a painting for that wall. And uh, I made the mistake of kind of saying, well, what, you know, what would you like up there? And my mom said, oh, one of your apple paintings. And I thought, okay, great, that's enough. And she, then she started, <laughs> okay, but I want a red apple and a green apple, okay? And I want them shiny. Okay, and can you put some leaves on them? Yes, and then and it just got into this. She, it was like this order form. She was just going down the box and checking, you know, like ordering a pizza, pepperoni, yes, uh, cheese, yes. So anyway, and she said, you know how you sometimes make the, as it goes away from the center, it's smudgy? She goes, yeah, I, she goes, I want smudgy. I said, okay, she said, but not too smudgy, just medium smudgy. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, so I don't know if any of you have had that experience with a commission, where all of a sudden you you start it starts feeling like it's that person's idea. But anyway, it was I mean it was my parents, so of course I was fine. But yeah, Commi commissions are tricky that way, aren't they? Yes. Uh, fall number. 11? X, 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 X. 11 or something, yeah. I started playing around with different, instead of just the square, let me think, were those just square? Yeah, two point perspective. Oh, I should have asked, I should have asked these two if they could uh, figure out if it was a one point or a two point perspective after our <laughs> workshop, yeah. <laughs> uh, but then I started playing with different shapes, you know, within that perspective. Yeah, they're kind of like a quilt shapes almost. 
Again, fall number, I don't know. It's it's up there. I can kind of see the title. But that, so that, I, that's, that would be fall to start. That would be, uh, is that to be It's an eight-sided, kind of an eight-sided, uh, yeah. well, it's two squares interlocking, yeah. if you want to look at it that way. So usually I'll, I'll get excited about a series of paintings and then do a whole bunch of them over a span of a few years and, that, and then I number them and it's, you know, so over, I don't know how many years I worked on the series of uh, apple paintings or fruit paintings, a few years. And uh, that's why the one was fall number 23 or something, 20 something. And then sometimes you just, you hit a, uh, one day you wake up and you're just like, I'm done with that series. I've, I've done 23 or 28 of those paintings and that, that was good. The, the gallery sometimes they'll say, oh, remember those paintings you used to do with those palm trees? Yeah, those sold really well. Can you still do some more of those? And it's like, you know, I, I think I, that ran its course. I, I can't do those anymore. Which is coming back to, it's, sometimes it's good not to be influenced by the market, by what sells, because then it would just be tempting to just keep copying yourself and just doing the same thing for decades and then you're known as the apple painter and you've never done anything else and then you've painted yourself into a corner and you're bored with what you're painting and, and the public gets bored with it because they've seen so many of them. That's why it's a little dangerous to just paint for what you think might sell. It's always better to do something you feel strongly about and then uh, let, let, the, let the bills go unpaid as they may. <laughs> oh, and there's another one. I didn't know how many of these I had. So yeah, playing with different patterns on the floor, or the landscape. Shiny apples. Some smudginess, but you know, just medium smudgy. Yeah. S series of. Oh, there's that one was tricky. You know, you've seen those uh, three-dimensional looking blocks, but I thought, what if that was on a flat plane, like it's a landscape? It was kind of tricky to do, and I just thought, is it going to create a weird optical illusion, which it kind of does, but it's kind of an experiment. Again, another quilt that I'm looking at. A quilt, yeah. I'm doing a lecture on illustrative quilts this Saturday, so oh. I'm looking at Oh, yeah. <laughs> Building blocks, or? Long term, yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, and then I've done a whole series of paintings of roses, and uh, you might see a theme in my work that I don't paint everything out to the edges; that I leave places unfinished. And uh, so I think definitely in some of these rose paintings, you see some of that. Uh, these are all. Most of these are called degree because I just like the the idea of how uh, the roses or flowers in general open one petal at a time. They start as a bud and they, so by degrees, they open up and blossom out, which is the same way we grow and learn and go through life. We learn by degrees or by steps. And so it, sometimes it's almost as if uh, it's these openings of petals, the way, the way life happens. Mm -hmm. You said that sometimes you like to leave the markings from, you know, creating it. Yeah. Like the little lines and stuff. And that, I think, on some of them, you know, that's really cool to leave the, you know, how it was drawn out oh, and stuff. Yeah, so it, sometimes it's nice to, to show or leave some of that process. Right. There, kind of the, so you get different, parts of the painting are finished in, in different stages, and so you see yeah. everything from the underpainting to the finished all, all in one shot. Yeah. So the whole painting in the beginning looked kind of like the bottom half, but then you, I finished the top. I, I don't know if that helps. But, oh, I thought I was going to show a whole bunch of rose paintings. Uh, I did a whole, I mentioned doing a bunch of palm tree paintings and the galleries would say, oh, those palm trees were great. So, you know, do some more of those. But I did a series with palm trees in front of ruins. 
you know, Roman or Greek or ancient ruins from somewhere. So I would, the trees were, of course, not necessarily right there, but I would superimpose the two images. Rise and fall, number something. Oh, I guess, do I only have one of those? Well, I'll show you some more uh, palm tree paintings. This is, uh, I do a lot of cloth paintings, as Charlotte mentioned in, in the beginning. So I thought I would show a couple of examples of how I hang that cloth in the studio. So I, I'll, I'll build a wooden armature and take some cloth and maybe even some chicken wire to build some volume, hang the cloth over it, and then put a strong light or something, a light source, and that's, that, that, I, I take that then to do the painting. Do I have the, the painting for that next? Yeah, so there's the painting for that. So it's obviously not exactly what's in the studio, but it serves as a way of getting the lights and darks and the folds in the cloth. So there's again, the setup, and there's the final painting. So that's uh, gold leaf that bordered. It's actually uh, it's not real 22 karat gold. It's more it's brass. It's that imitation leaf. So but that's what that gold goldish border is. Uh, put some palm fronds behind there. Here's another example. Here's a twisted cloth hanging on the, there's some chicken wire probably in there somewhere. And then here's the painting that came from that. And then there's some dark uh, linen horizontally laid behind it. At least, you know, I had two different setups, but here's, here's the white cloth setup. And then the, Sometimes uh, I take myself too seriously, and I think there's that this painting might have some, I don't know, some type of uh, profound feeling to it. And my kids will look at it and they'll say, well, "Where's where did that tornado painting go?" I said, you mean tornado? You know, the tornado cloth. I'm like, "Oh yeah." So they they have a way of bringing you back down to earth in a fun way, but. Uh, so they, my daughter calls that, or they call it the tornado painting. <laughs> to, and that never occurred to me beforehand. You know, it's like, oh. How do you apply the, the leaf to the, the border? Uh, this one, this one doesn't have leaf in it. I think that's just sort of a painted border. But this uh, the sizing, there's a, there's different ways. Anything sticky will really get that gold leaf to stick to it. Uh, so there's just a product called gold leaf sizing, and it's not the water gilding like people do on frames, but it's kind of a sticky substance. Uh, you could probably use paint medium, like liquid or gal kit or something, and when it's right at that sticky stage, stick your paint to it, and it would probably do the same thing. But I, I bought some specific product that was called gold sizing, and it was it's uh, oil-based type of thing when you paint it on you kind of wait a little bit before it to get just kind of the right tackiness you put your gold leaf down and then brush off the excess and, and the reason I use that imitation is just because I end up sanding it scraping it painting over it and I thought well there's no sense in using the really the fancy gold if you're just gonna paint over it and anyway yeah so that's I think this one is just a painted sort of a border which you'll notice I do that a lot in these paintings. So I'll, I'll invent a border, sort of, with the paint. Sort of like that. I mean, that was just, uh, yeah, this one is called Exchange. Exchange number five, because it was the fifth one of that series. But the idea of ex maybe exchanging the one cloth for the other, or. Uh, we gotta share the stuff for the wall. 
a, ch a chair that's on its side and a chair that's just sitting upright and whether it's in a landscape or a, you know sometimes these backgrounds aren't real spaces obviously some of the ones you've seen uh, so this one uh, my wife Vicky is my, my biggest fan uh, and she you know she's great to the point where most of the paintings I paint, she'll say, let's keep that one. <laughs> oh, I love that one, let's keep that one. And I'll say, I have to say, well, the idea is that I send them to a gallery and they sell them hopefully and send us some money, that's how we're, <laughs> but she's, she is so good that she wants to keep them. So on this one, I said, okay, we can keep that one. She said, let's keep that one for ourselves. Let's not sell that. And uh, it was in a show at the BYU Museum of Art and they said we would like to buy one of your paintings that are in the show for our permanent collection. And I thought, oh no, they're gonna ask for exchange number five. Sure enough, they said, we'd like to buy exchange number five. And I had just a second on the phone where I thought, what do I do, what do I do? Do I go, do I break my promise <laughs> to my wife that I said we'd keep these? And, uh, or do I take a chance to get a painting in a museum? You know, that's a big deal. Yeah. And so. I said, I said, I told my wife we'd keep that one, so I, I'm not gonna sell that one. And I thought, oh, I just blew it. And they said, well, could you do another painting in that series and we'll buy that one? And I just thought, oh, perfect. You know, I got to keep the one that we wanted and then I got to do one for the museum for their collection. And I believe this next slide, that's the one in their collection. Actually, I like this one better, so I was like, can I trade you back for the one? <laughs> But that's, uh, that's in the BYU Museum collection. It's called Exchange Number 8. So, again, it's the one chair kind of tipped over with the red cloth. In front of it. And then I just sort of sometimes just make up these backgrounds. It, you know, it could be a landscape. It could be something else. Very Roscoe. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so see, you can see maybe so, I, I just love Rothko, so I, sometimes I'm thinking in my mind, oh, kind of a, just make a, a background, which, you know, sort of, kind of make that really background with these, with these, What's yeah, the I've got name? a Rothko and a tornado in How do you spell that name, Rothko? No, I think uh, to answer, yeah, I, I'll have an idea and I'll sketch it in a sketchbook, and it, it can come from it can come from all kinds of places. Whether I'm reading, contemplating, a conversation, uh, or just daydreaming, or usually most of the ideas come while I'm painting. So I'm painting on one painting, and I'm like, oh, wouldn't that be cool if I did it this way? And so there's there's like I. I'm painting on this painting and I have ideas for three others and then I'm painting on this one and I have ideas for, so usually that's when the inspiration or the ideas comes when I'm working on one painting. I'll, I'll say, well, what if I did it this way or this way? Uh, but yes, to answer your, your second question is for me, I'm, for me, I'm thinking and pondering about questions like the big questions. Uh, and to me, they're spiritual questions like, What's this life all about? Uh, you know. Can, can you say just a perfect example that we just had? Yeah, or let something, me. Something, the hurricane one. Oh, the, the tornado one? Yeah, the tornado one. Um, what you want to? Well, for me, if, if I want, if, yeah. and usually, like I said, I'll give a, a one word title and kind of let the viewer decide what it is for them. But I can reveal for me what this means. Uh, and sometimes I hesitate to do that because I don't want to tell you what this is supposed to be, right? So, uh, but uh, for me, the white cloth maybe has to do with the resurrection and the earthly cloth is flat as in the death, the death and the resurrection. So, uh, so you have this brown, it's linen, but it's a brown kind of earthly cloth and maybe this one that is lit as if almost from above, rising up. So, and that was your intention when you began. Yeah. You, that's what you yeah. Were. When I did my sketch, I thought, oh, what if, what if, you know. Thank you. 
the name of that one. What's that? Sorry? What is the name of that one? Um, Ascension. I, I know I've got tornado in my mind, but I know that's not the name of it. I think it. the kids named it right. It's um, Ascension. You can't read. Oh, it's at the bottom there. Yeah, uh, ex, it's exaltare or exal. Yeah, I think it's exaltare, which is uh, Latin for exultant, to exalt. Yeah. So uh, this one. Maybe this one, uh, these two, these, all these paintings that are exchanged with a red cloth and a white cloth, I specifically, uh, I can tell you the reference on this is uh, from the Old Testament, Isaiah 118, our, our sins will be as scarlet, they'll be made white as snow. So I just had this whole idea of exchanging one state of being to another. How does that happen? So for, for me, in my mind, uh, it's me thinking about how how does that work? You know, how 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 can you go from one to the other? How does that happen? Literally, how? You know, uh, so that's what I'm thinking about when I'm painting these. Uh, I should give some examples. Let's see. This painting and this painting. Uh, they were bought by a. Uh, he's actually LDS, but no. A lot of times, I'm painting cell in a gallery to whoever, and I don't know what they see in it. I don't know, and I don't have a chance to say, "Hey, this is why I painted this." They might buy him just because they they like him. This this art uh, this collector LDS, uh, and uh, you know, we never had a chance. He never asked what they were about, and I never told him. I'm not sure what he sees in him. What does he see? Did I go? No. Okay, I think we're coming up on it. Uh, it'll be in here somewhere. I'll have another story. But this is called triplice number something because triplice just is Latin for three. It just sounds fancier if you use Latin, right? It's just so it just means three. Uh, it's a little. This one the BYU Museum owns also uh, the first bowl has water in it. The second bowl has, um, well, it looks like either red wine or blood, but it's actually Hawaiian punch concentrate. Because <laughs> it, looks, it looks like what I wanted it to look like without either having to get red wine or blood. So. And the third bowl is empty. Yeah, so, that stuff dies horribly too. What's that? Hawaiian punch concentrate. Yeah. It is a horrible dye. <laughs> yeah. I got, uh, and that's I got just a photo of my youngest daughter who drank. Oh. Big pink. Oh. Pink all around. Probably her face. stained her face for a week. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and that's just my cloth on my studio floor. I have an old wood floor, and that's just the, just throw it right down there on the floor. Sometimes people come and visit my studio and step on them or. You know, I have something draped on a chair, and they'll sit on the chair, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, there's, uh, these are really in different order, but, uh, so I've done a whole series of paintings. This is another series over the years of taking cropping, a, I crop a piece of an old master painting out of, off the internet or a, a book copy that part of that old master painting in the background and then put a still life of something in the foreground. So this, the background is a portion of a Titian painting and it was a descent from the cross painting. And uh, so those have always just intrigued me and I just found them so beautiful and so touching. Uh, and then I borrowed a bowl from my mother-in-law and I said, ooh, that's a cool bowl. Can I use that? So then I'll set up a table and I'll paint the Titian part in the background and put the bowl in front. Yeah, so that's probably, it, the title of these are simple too, it's Bowl with Titian, I think, something like that. But, uh, I really like that idea of an old master painting in the background. I, I, I got that idea, I was traveling with friends in Italy and we were in this old monastery 
and there was this old fresco on the wall and it was cracked and chipping and falling apart and right in front of it on a table the monks or the nuns I'm not sure who had put a, a vase of flowers so here you have this kind of beautiful vibrant living well if they were cut I don't know but maybe they aren't living anymore but these beautiful flowers that kind of represented life in front of this old decaying man-made image of something and I thought oh I could I could run with that I could go with that kind of juxtaposition of the decaying and the living and there's a lot of symbolism or, or philosophy behind that and the, the palm trees actually the living palm tree with the man-made ruins so the decline of the man-made thing the living tree in front I mean there was just so much uh, rich ground there Okay, so I do have a few of these. This is uh, another uh, copy again of an old master painting in the background and with a vase of water in the foreground. And that whole painting, I don't know if you can see these kind of rectangles. I, I've done this a couple of times. The whole painting is gold leafed in the background and then I did the, the whole entire canvas is gold leafed and it's about that size in reality. That's about, more, that's about life size. So you put the gold leaf on and paint it over it? Yeah, paint it over. It's kind of hard. It's like painting on glass. It doesn't stick very well the first few layers. And so after a few layers, it, it starts to adhere better. I hope in 100 years, the whole painting just doesn't go. <laughs> <laughs> so can you see the gold leaf? You can only really in that top left corner. Can you even tell that it's uh, this one? Yeah, there's a little bit of the gold leaf shining through right here. And up in that corner, and a little bit up in that corner. What a waste of gold leaf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can't yeah. tell. <laughs> yeah, I think I have another one that has more of it in it. But uh, This is another Titian copy. Uh, and it's actually the same painting as that first one with the arm hanging down. This is just another portion of that painting. painting I think it's uh, yeah it's, it, well it was it was a project where it was really rewarding and fun to study some of my heroes and the old master paintings kind of a fun fun way to, to pay homage to them but also to make my own painting but to have fun co copying some of their work you ever been to a museum and seen people set up with their easel there mm -hmm. has anyone done that <laughs> I want to go I want go do that and I never have but I want to go to the National Gallery or one of these big museums that allow that and get a permit and just sit in front of a, an old master painting a painter right from because these are all from books or photographs and things fun experience yeah oh here's the one that, that whole that whole canvas is covered with gold leaf and then it's painted over and that one you you can see it maybe more it's really a warm painting you can really so this this area right here probably doesn't have any paint over it that's the gold leaf shining through and up here you can actually see a square of gold leaf here you can see a square of gold leaf but the whole canvas was covered with the gold leaf and then I painted it over so uh, again my kids refer to this as the Vegas painting because <laughs> it's all like you know Vegas with the fake gold. And, oh, no. Yeah. So they call it the Vegas painting. Do you use like glazes so you can see through? Yeah, yeah, I, I use a lot of glazes. Yeah, especially in those outer areas, real thin paint so that the gold leaf is kind of showing through. There's a hint of a red robe there, but it's also gold leaf showing through. That one we kept. In our living room. So. Oh, she won that one yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad too. Sometimes I'll, we go back and forth a little bit about which ones to keep, but there's some of them where I'm like, oh, I'm sure glad I kept that one. And then some of them that get sold and the gallery send you a check and you're like, that's nice, but I kind of wish we still had that painting. But, oh well, they're kind of like kids. <laughs> Sending your kids off. I see a lot of you yeah, nodding heads. Yeah, but it, 
and it's fun if you get to see some of these paintings after years and you see them again. It's like seeing seeing someone you a, a good old friend you hadn't seen for a long time. Um, that one actually is only this big, so that's deceiving. Uh, occasionally, I'll paint a small painting, but I I like to work. A lot of these are actual size, but that one's not. That one's that big, and it's just called water. I'm not that creative with my titles. <laughs> I did a few of these where I actually photographed myself or someone holding a bowl. And those are called offering. Mm. Yeah, I look back at some of these and I think, yeah, I should do some more of those. those are, I like those. Those are all kind of small because the hands are life size. It would be a little weird to do those really, really large and have these hands that are this big. <laughs> Offering numbers something or other. And then uh, more cloth pieces. Uh, so I, I'll set these things up. I'll build like a fake table in my studio, and put the linen over it, and then I'll have a chair. I collect old chairs, put the cloth on that, put a light source on it. The window part I'll make up. Uh, but uh, or, or sometimes look at books of old architecture to get some ideas on windows, but usually they're just sort of made up. How are we doing? Are most still okay? All right. Uh, this one's called Evening, number something or other. I'm thinking of uh, maybe the, the evening of the Last Supper. So there are a whole series of these that uh, chairs and tables with maybe plates or things. This one has a few grapes and olives left over. You know Jason Dibble? Yeah, I mean I trying to think if we've ever met in person it's like we see you see people's artworks and shows over the years and you get you feel like you know that person but it's like wait have we ever actually met in person I think we did meet at Springville once he does a lot of barns mm -hmm. yeah and I see some influences of some ah. of your stuff in Dibble's stuff oh, like barns and stuff interesting yeah he's a really good painter he's, he lives in Idaho is that right does he teach at BYU Idaho In Provo. Oh, maybe I'm mixing him up. There's another guy that does. Anyway, I know the work, so I feel like I know him. But like I said, I'm not sure if we've actually met in person. But, and, and maybe we come from the same lineage of maybe we had some of the similar teachers. You know, you, you talk about who your teachers are and who their teachers were. And it's sort of like a family tree is that you can kind of trace. Uh, so... Uh, my professors when I was at BYU was Jim Christensen and Frank Magleby, Bob Marshall, Bruce Smith, uh, and Wolf Barsh. And I think people say, "Oh, you look like you studied with Wolf Barsh." Who he and Trevor Salvi were, for, you know, knew each other, and their teacher was Dale Fletcher, whatever. So there's this sort of lineage of, of people that you can kind of trace styles through, or, or some commonalities. And then I, I just do a lot of cloth paintings. Cloth on chairs, cloth on whatever, floating cloth, tornado cloth. And I love leaving some of it unfinished for some reason. Well, there's probably reasons for it. Oh, this is one. Uh, you know, speaking of collectors, I think uh, this was in a magazine somewhere and a collector in Illinois uh, who had quite an art collection bought it and you know again I to me it has certain meaning certain uh, symbolism but that's just what I'm thinking of when I paint it and so uh, you know he saw something in it who knows what you know that, uh, it meant something to him and I was grateful for that but but uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting sometimes. And sometimes people 
will say, hey, this is what I see in this, and, and sometimes it's what I was thinking, and sometimes it's completely different, which is just fine. I mean, that's, that's great. A little of both, but probably more the former in that I try to, it's, it's hard to arrange cloth so that it, it's aesthetically, like the folds just feel good. And, and also, sometimes if the folds are going the right direction to help the composition, to help your, the viewer's eye go to a certain place. Uh, but yeah, then I also do some editing too. Um, you know, I'll leave out a fold, I'll, I'll change, you know, something, in my photograph of the cloth that I don't like, sometimes I'll edit that out. And actually there's a painting at home that we kept and it's in our room and it just bugs me that I didn't edit the cloth in this one area. I'm just like, Dang. Like do you see some weird image sometimes where you think, oh my gosh, there's a clown right there. <laughs> or, is that something yeah, that yeah. irritates you? And sometimes, yeah, sometimes I don't see it and the painting's finished and it's in a gallery or something and says, hey, I see a face in there. And I'm like, oh no, you know. And you know, like Bev Doolittle would put the paint horses in the Aspens, you know, I'm like, no, I'm not trying to do that. It's just a coincidence. Yeah, so I spend, it's frustrating sometimes. I'll spend hours arranging the cloth on a chair or on an armature or something and then I'll just, I, I don't like that. I'll take it down, put it up again, take it down, put it up again just spend a ton of time sometimes rearranging the cloth so that it just, sometimes it's just the gut feeling, it's just got to feel aesthetically pleasing, the folds, the shadows, the highlights, and, and then somehow I think somehow those folds can help with the meaning, and that's hard to describe how that could be, but I think somehow it does. I think those folds can be significant. Describe it in words? I don't know. Uh, so I hope that answered your question. Uh, so yeah, I, I probably spent quite a bit of time messing with that cloth till it just felt like it had the right, you know, balance or eye movement so that your eye traveled up through the folds or something. Yeah. So again, this painting, uh, and maybe I already explained it, this collector in Illinois bought it, but you know, to me it was again one of this, uh, idea of death and life, uh, burial and resurrection or something in, I don't know what he saw in it, we never discussed it, so anyway, it's, it is an interesting thing to kind of see what people, more gold leaf, more gold leaf. yeah. And it's underneath the chair too. You can actually see a bit of it. Sometimes I'll paint again kind of thinly so that some of that gold leaf comes through a little bit. A little more. Uh, evening number seven. That one's in our, we kept that one. We're just deciding this week whether we would still keep it or send it off somewhere. Another one called Exultare, the whole idea of exult, lift up, palm fronds, background. Oh, occasionally, this is a little bit rare, but I, I, I've been inching towards the last few years doing more figurative work. And so uh, this. This one kind of combined my cloth paintings with the figurative, uh, and then and then I, of course, had to just put a bowl of water in front of it because I do that on other paintings. <laughs> I just sort of did that again. Yeah. Oh. I haven't yes. done a whole a few of these. That's not from a master's. No, this is, yeah, I, I hired a, a student at Snow College. I said, will you pose for me? And can I take some pictures, you know? And can I set you up like this and drape a cloth over you? And yeah, 
put a bowl of water in front of you, and he was like, what, okay. <laughs> it's kind of funny, when, if you have just a, a piece of glass, what you see through the glass is normal, as soon as you put water in it, it, re it reverses it. So here's his shoulder, and here's the white cloth. So the water in it reverses everything. And I, I don't know the physics behind that exactly. It's some kind of refraction. But it's, it's a lens. It's a lens. It's behaving like a lens. So it, um, it reverses hmm. things. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, it goes upside down. Yeah, so uh, anyway, it's kind of just, it was just fun when you're you're sitting there painting it and you're like, oh, that's all reversed. Isn't that crazy? There's another one I did about the same time. Is that the same student? Yeah, same model, yeah. Couldn't have been very comfortable. No, I made him, yeah. I said, can you, can you lay on this thing so your back is really <laughs> not comfortable? Tell me when it hurts, and then that's the right spot where I'm going to photograph <laughs> And there's another one of the old masters uh, paintings in the background. Again, a descent from the cross uh, image. And the, this artist is, uh, they don't know the artist's name. He's just known as the master of the St. Bartholomew altarpiece. Oh, no, I have that wrong. This is Van der Weyden. It's a little different, let me think. This is the one with all the, the gold leaf Vegas painting, that was the master of the St. Bartholomew altarpiece. So this must be Van der Weyden. I don't know, I get them mixed up sometimes. But yeah, I just love those paintings. I just, when I go to museums, I just love all the old paintings that were done for the Catholic cathedrals. And when I go on vacation, for me, I want to go visit a cathedral. You know, people want to go see this or that. I, I, is there a cathedral in town? I want to go to that. I just love them. They're just so majestic and beautiful, and I just find them just absolutely stunning. The old cathedral. Uh, more cloth. This time it's purple and white rather than red and white. Gold leaf border. And then again, maybe the Rothko influence, or maybe just yeah. landscape, but it no feels lines, feels like a landscape. What's that? Sorry. No horizontal strips. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, what, what's that name? You, you keep saying Roth something. Rothko. R O T H K O. R O T H K O. Okay. He's that one I showed in the beginning that was just non, no subject matter, just. Rectangles and yeah. squares, yeah. fuzzy edges. Non-objective abstract. Yeah, he was uh, his 1950s is when he was popular. Or well, he, he died. I, I can't remember what year. 1950 something. He died maybe or 1960. Uh, uh, that's his American. He he was an immigrant from one of the Eastern Bloc countries. And Rothko is a, like a shortened version. I can't remember what his... Marcus Yakovlevich Rothkowitz. Rothkowitz. Yeah. <laughs> Czechoslovakia or something like that. Or where does it say he's from? La Latvia. Oh, Latvia. Jewish. Okay, yeah. Immigrated to the United States like a lot of artists did. New York, you know, New York artists in the 1950s. This one, uh, we're still okay, we're all right. Um, I love, again, old master paintings. So if you know Bouguereau, French artist, 1800s, 1850s, 60s, 70s. In fact, he probably would have been the most famous artist in the whole world, except Impressionism came along. And all of a sudden, realistic, highly refined, classical, classically trained painters became out of fashion. Every uh, Impressionism became the new thing, and that's right when he was at his prime, and so he was just like pushed aside and by the art world for a hundred years, and now, you know, his 
he's getting the reputation and the, the praise that he might have deserved, but uh, it, just bad timing of things that happened. But anyway, so I love Bouguereau's paintings. Some people think they're a little too sentimental, or too too sweet, and too. But he did a few paintings of uh, Mary, the mother of Christ, cradling her dead son on her lap. And you know, I just they're just so beautiful and so touching and just so. So powerful, uh, and so I thought, wow, what, how could I interpret that from the way I do things? And I thought, she often is wearing a purple cloth, and then his white uh, draped body is laying across her lap. And I thought, well, I'm just, I'm gonna. And in Bouguereau's versions, she was sitting on a chair with. So I thought, oh, chairs, cloth, I can do that, but I just won't have people in. It. So that's sort of my take on Bouguereau's Pieta painting. One of my chairs I've collected. Oh, this is, <laughs> yes, this brings me back. Someone made a comment. Uh, I had done a landscape. I didn't think it was that successful. Uh, and the, the paintings actually that size are possibly slightly bigger. I thought, how do I fix this landscape or do I just paint over it? And I, I set up these two railroad ties in my studio with a cloth over it. I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll do that and see what happens. And then I thought, I just like it with the landscape in the background with this, this cloth. And so uh, I left it, but a couple people said, oh, that's really cool the way you put that eye in there. <laughs> I was like, what? I, don't, I, didn't, I had never seen it in, until someone mentioned it to me, but they thought that this, that this, and then this came around, and here's the pupil, and they were seeing this eye, and they said, oh, that's so neat the way you put an eye in your painting. I'm like, oh, I didn't know I had, so. Someone made the comment that, you know, about do people see other things in it, and to me, that, that never occurred to me, but uh, that one's called Nativity, number three, I believe, yes, and that, that was one that's been around, it's been in different galleries. I tried it in this gallery, tried it in this gallery. It's been in a show at the BYU Museum. It's been here and there. It was in a gallery in Scottsdale, Arizona for probably four or five years. And just this fall, Vicki and I were saying, okay, well, on the next trip I go down there, I'm gonna bring this painting back and we're gonna keep it. We're just gonna keep it in the house because we've always liked it. It just never seemed to resonate with any collector. And just last week, a, a woman walked in the gallery and said, eh, yeah, I want that one. <laughs> I'm like, darn, yeah, I mean, great, but we were gonna keep that one, but anyway, it's always good. It, it formed to find a good home. This is, uh, that's actually a little small painting about this big. I was, I, I was, uh, I applied to be in a competition, a still life competition at a, an atelier in New York City and the, the deal was they would, uh, out of all the people that applied, I don't know how many people applied, they picked 12 finalists, and those 12 people go to New York to this gallery, and you had six days to paint a painting, and you got from nine o'clock to five o'clock, and they would actually sound a, a bell, and you had to, you couldn't start painting or do anything with your painting until nine o'clock, and they would ring a bell and say, okay, you may start, and you started painting, and then at lunch they ring a bell and said, step away from your painting, go eat lunch. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, five, six days from nine to five, and this is, and you had to do the whole thing from scratch, and, and it was a competition, and uh, that was my, I was gonna bring that, I thought, oh, I should just bring an actual painting tonight. So I, with I, those six days, how did you manage your oils, uh, your layers, and fill them I, I think I used dryer. Are you familiar with that? Just a couple drops. It's not, it's not advised for the long, longevity of your paintings. It may crack your paint layers if, if you use too much of it. It may yellow your paint layers. So maybe in a hundred or two hundred years, the painting will be dark and cracked. I don't know, but yeah. It's called dryer. Or? Dryer. Yeah. There's a Japan dryer, which is safer to use. Uh, the other word for, that is substitute for that is sicative. S I C C I, or is it a sicative? T I B, sicative. But it's a dryer. And the, another one that was always popular was cobalt dryer. But 
any heavy metal is not good for you to, to get on you. So it's really advised, and I think cobalt would have a, a chan uh, tendency to yellow and darken your paint more. So, so the cobalt that isn't used that much anymore, but Japan dryer. Versus the, um, I'm trying to remember the other thing. Medium, it helps, it helps it dry faster, but it would. I, I think uh, liquid will help liquid. dry it faster. Liquid or Galkid? Yeah. Galkid. Galkid, yeah. And that's what I usually use is Galkid. But it, then sometimes you even put a drop or two of a dryer in it, and it, I mean, overnight you could paint on it again. Every, every morning when you came in, it would be dry, dry enough to paint was, on. Was this the painting you entered, or was this the painting you did? This is the one I did, in yeah, the, in the competition. And what was that thing? Uh, it looked impressive to me. Oh, thanks. Well, I, I mean, I got some good comments from the judge, but um, he said some things about it, and I, I had to agree. I, I never really resolved the background very well and the way it reflected through the glass. And that was one po point where I thought, yeah, I, that could have been better. I like the eggs, and I like the little metal uh, weight. I like this area, and the judge, one of the judges said he'd really like that area, but, yeah. but there were other things he thought. Well, you brought all those things to the competition. Uh, partly, that was interesting. So you, you've seen these cooking shows where they reveal at the last minute what the mystery items are. So they, they did that here. They said, bring your own items, but you have to use some of our items. And so the, the first morning, right at 9 o'clock, they uncovered this table, and there was a table full of things. And you had to pick, I think, at least three of their items. So that way you couldn't have the whole composition and the whole painting already worked out. You know, like maybe you've done six versions of it, and so by the time you get there, you just know exactly what to do. This way you had to kind of create it that morning and start. You just in the surface, you already know what you do. Yeah, How so the, the eggs were theirs. Uh, I brought the, the elk spine bone. Oh. I brought the metal weight. I brought the glass vase. The bowl, the bowl was theirs. The eggs were theirs. This glass bottle was theirs. I brought the cloth. Of course, I knew I was going to bring some cloth, <laughs> but I should have. Yeah, there's things that should. So I didn't win the competition. That was our, you know, that's, it was fun. It was a great experience. But we did go bowling one night, <laughs> and I won the bowling. <laughs> so, but I have to, there's a caveat to that. I was the only one not drinking. So <laughs> as the night went on, my bowling got better, and all theirs was getting worse. So. Uh, I, with some of these cloth paintings, it was like you send in a portfolio of five works and then they judge it on that or something. Did that one sell? No, I, I, I probably won't sell that one. I'll probably keep that just because it was a special kind of week. And well, your, your, the silken look or the satin look of the fabric is just fabulous. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that's. Have you, have you ever painted silk fabric? Because I do a lot of this cotton fabric. And it, it's challenging, but the silk stuff, ooh, that's like really more time consuming. The silky, shiny fabrics. Uh, so I do a few portraits occasionally. And that's again, probably life size, so it's only this big. Is that your daughter? No, uh, no, that's just a Snow College student that I asked if she would just, I have one of my daughter, I don't have a slide of it, I've never finished a painting. The problem with, I'll give a painting to my wife and I'll say, oh, I still want to work on that. Can I take it back to the studio? So I have a portrait of my daughter and one of my wife that's, uh, that I take back to the studio and I, I say I'm going to finish them and then I still have them there. This is another, uh, just, well, the hands of a, a student that agreed to sit for me. That's the same model. She, uh, she had these great dreadlocks. Oh, they were fun. Mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. Was that a spring, though? I feel like I oh, I think it was. Thing. Yes, it was. One of the spring salons, maybe, or, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. now that you say that, that was at uh, Springville once. Uh, that's a, 
kind of self-portrait. Um, we did, it's six feet tall, so it's life size. It's six feet tall by three feet wide. And in one of my classes at Snow, I, that was the assignment, do a, a six foot large self-portrait. And you could do it any way, but I thought just to challenge myself, I would do it all from a mirror. Well, except the palm tree. I kind of made that up in the, the ruins. The Roman ruins are from a photograph. But uh, the rest of it was done standing in front of a mirror. So it's a little tricky because you're standing in front of a mirror and then you have to draw and you have to get back in the thing. <laughs> very, very time consuming. A, a skull, yeah. A skull. <laughs> Just a, a plastic model. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little big, maybe. A skull, I don't know. And a compass in my other hand. Fulcrum. I like how that word is raised, like it's floating. Yeah, I wanted to do that. Uh, I don't know. Occasionally I'll make the clock float or the chair or something. Makes it seem like. This one, uh, I, admit I was going to bring that book. This was on the cover of a, a catalog recently. Dialogue. It's anyone heard of Dialogue? It's a journal of Mormon thought. I think it's the subtitle. This was on the cover last fall. This is one of those where I, I, I just really wanted the cloth to be a certain shape. Just wanted those folds to kind of lend to the composition instead of just being really arbitrary. This one I just finished yesterday, and it's in the uh, Snow College. It's going to be part of the faculty show, and it's it, the actual painting might be actually a little bigger than that. So I've, for years I've wanted to do a cracked mud landscape with a base of water on it, and finally this spring, because of the wildfires, this area in Thistle, which is on the way to our house, flooded, and then it dried out the crack. And I thought there it is. Because I've been looking for cracked mud places for a so while. So where you calling this one? This one is called Satiate. It's not parched. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're they're related. <laughs> I always thought Satiate meant just to quench your thirst, but you look in the dictionary and Satiate means quench to almost the point of overfill, overflow, over overdoing it. I thought that was interesting. It's more than just quenching your thirst. It's like there's there's more there than you're just gorging yourself. Well, I don't know about gorge, for, not for me, but it's like there's more there's more than enough if you want it. I don't. know. That's what I was thinking. I don't know. It makes me want to get a bottle of water right now. <laughs> yeah, it makes you kind of thirsty. Yeah. So if this is another, you know. Uh, Maybe this will be the last story, but again, Vicky's my, my biggest support, and biggest fan, but sometimes I'll be at the studio and I'll have some crazy idea for a painting. I'll come home and I'll say, good news and bad news. Said, well, what's the good news? I said, I, I just got an idea for a whole series of paintings. I could probably do 20 of these. And she'll say, well, what could possibly be the bad news? And I, if that's, that sounds great. I'll say, this series of paintings is probably less marketable than the last series. <laughs> so that's how I feel about this. I'm not sure what kind of reception this is going to get. Who wants to have a big painting of cracked mud in their house? I love cracked Maybe no. Do you like it? Well, he may, and that's what she said. She said, you never know. Maybe someone will like it. But I'm thinking this probably, I just painted an eight-foot large painting that maybe no one will ever want. But, you know, who knows? Maybe someone will want it. Ranger Hunter Water District. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe it'll hang in in the office of the Water Conservancy uh, somewhere. But uh, but it's, again, going back to the very first thing Charlotte asked is about selling your work.
work and uh, you know, sometimes you just have to ignore what you think is the popular thing or what might sell and just paint what you just want to paint from your heart. And I think that uh, has a way of, of being the best route in the end. Uh, I, th I think your work is more meaningful to yourself. If, if yeah, you I think that spirit, that. the feeling you have doing it comes across. I, well, thank you, and I, I hope so. But you know, uh, maybe this will end up in our house because no one will. Mm -hmm. but, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how you feel about crack. How much room? <laughs> Yeah, yeah see, that's the other thing. I'm not sure I have a wall that would fit an eight-foot painting, so that's another thought. Yeah, and I, I do that all the time. I'll, I'll get, have this idea. Oh, I'm going to do this huge painting, and then I'm like, wait a minute, can I get this out the door? And then if I get it out the door, it won't fit in my car. How am I going to transport this? So I have at times created a box or a crate and tied it to the roof rack of my car. I'm going down the highway with this thing that's wider than the car. It's, but, it's, you know, sometimes you just have to just go with what you think is your, you know, is your passion and figure out the logistics later. So, but thank you. Thank you so much for all your questions and your, your comments. Appreciate it.